Hey, and welcome back to PD8 UK. In this episode, this is the full interview I did with Gurdas Singh, whose father was brutally attacked in Manchester back in June. With the Grumpy Gits, I got to sit down with Gerdes and talk about the effects that this has had on his family, his father's condition, but also about the interesting side of it in that Gerdes is a doctor and he's seeing the system from inside the NHS and also being a service user outside the NHS and some very interesting revelations there. As I say, welcome back to PDA Dad UK. Before we go on, can you go hit like, hit subscribe, and ring the bell? You'll always know when I've got new content coming up, and you'll really be helping me to smash that 10,000 subscriber mark. It will be a huge thing for me. So please do help. Go do it now. As I say, we are interviewing Gerdes in this interview, and Gerdes, just uh, uh, an astonishing conversation I managed to have with him. His insights into the NHS, but also what's happened to his family and the fact that in spite of all the progress we've made in the world, and we talk about it on this channel a lot with, you know, different forms of either sexuality or race or uh, religion or whatever, we seem to have made so many strides, but we can see that all it takes is one simple act of aggression and violence and it sets it all back decades and it's sad that this still goes on in the world. So, uh, as I say, this was part of the Grumpy Gits. This is the full interview. So, please do sit back and uh, enjoy. I am here with the fantastic Gerdes. Gerdes, how are you today, my man? I'm good, thank you. I've had clinics this morning and I'll be back in the hospital this afternoon. So, yeah, you're a medical student. You're you're very close to finishing. Yeah, so I'm a final year. Uh, we don't have a gap between penultimate and final year. So, we went straight through and I've got three years left. Uh, three years three months left because we have our finals in january awesome well done congratulations on that of course the reason we brought you on so just to explain to you guys chris was originally going to be with us for this but he's not feeling well this morning so uh this has been left to me and gertis to discuss but to be honest gertis you're the focus here because of what's happened to you guys recently so some of you may have seen in the news the attack uh in manchester on gertis's father and the ramifications that that's had the the individual involved was sentenced uh, he's got three years in jail before we get onto that side of it i mean can you give us a bit of background on your father and your your life in the uk how are you guys going to be here what what your father's like my father came to this country approximately about 40 years ago uh, he came because he was helping with like the Sikh prayers they do like a lot of tours where they teach Sikhs about like different values but also about different parts of the prayers um, and my dad's trained as a priest he actually trained with the Indian army growing up as well but oh, he wow. yeah he's had like all sorts of parts of his life he actually like persuaded me and my sister to go into the cadets as well when we were in high school just shows testament to his being so when he was growing up his uncle and aunt uh, couldn't have children so he actually went to live with them rather his parents so that they had support whilst they were growing as well and then he came to this country and met my mum, who was here. So her parents actually came after World War II and they came as part of like the drive to uh, pick up jobs that um, soldiers used to have. And we know that like Sikhs were a massive part of World War II as well in terms of we have a lot of family who fought in World War II as well. People then, forget that, don't they? I, I think, mm -hmm. we're, I mean, obviously we're going to edge into the whole topic of racism in this conversation, but... People forget that just because someone's foreign in, in the sense of, you know, clearly you're you're English born, you're you're part of this country, but people mm -hmm. see this sort of divide and it's often based on things that they will blame on history. But actually, like you say, the Sikhs were so involved in World War II and actually contributed to the freedoms that we have today. And your dad was a part of that. Yeah, exactly. As in, like, my one of my fun facts is that Sikhs were actually the second biggest religion on our side for the World War II. So we've fought for this country and we always will, yeah. in terms of regardless of the racism that we fought for. Like, my sister's a teacher, my other sister works in a hospital, I'm training to be a doctor. My mum was a pharmacy technician as well, and she works and heads up the vaccination centres in Manchester. All of us are very giving people and we've all gone into careers where we want to educate and inspire and help save the lives of everybody in this country as well. 
And I'm guessing that's really largely inspired by your father from what we've, we've spoken a bit before this and you were telling me about what a giving and incredibly graceful man your father is. Yeah, as in he's so the type of person, like I don't use the word peaceful for most people because I think a lot of people are very confrontational in terms of we stand up for what's right, which we should, but my dad is peaceful to the core as in he avoids confrontation as much as possible. He doesn't get into arguments. He's the type of person who lets it go. And so when we were thinking of careers, he was very much the type of person who was like, go into careers that will help people. And so we all took that on board through his inspiration. And so just him going through this now, being broken like this, um, through literally a case of mistaken identity, it makes you lose faith in the entire world, to be honest. We'll get on to the whole mistaken identity thing, but do you want to give us, fill us in the details? What actually happened on that day? What happened to your dad? On the 23rd of June, at 6.25pm, which for most of us is a very busy time, where like pubs were really alert and active loads of people in Manchester city centre my dad was taking the same route home that he's taken for about 30 years he was walking his normal route down like the busiest street so Tib Street's one of the biggest busiest streets Oldham Street is one of the biggest biggest and these are full with pubs and essentially this man has walked past another man and his girlfriend and he's brushed past her so it was another man yeah he's the one who's brushed past and made contact with this guy's girlfriend. Yeah, exactly. Same and time as your dad's walking by, but hasn't made contact. My dad was literally behind this other man, just walking, didn't know either of them. And the man he pushed past her didn't know the couple either. And this girlfriend has turned around to her boyfriend and said, that man hit me and speaking and gesturing at my dad. Now, my dad's just walking past and then this boyfriend basically tries to engage with my dad and essentially um, tries to pursue him because my dad's like, look, I'm so sorry. I think you've got the wrong person. I'm trying to basically get away from him because this guy is getting really aggressive. This guy just basically decides to pursue my dad for quite a lengthy amount of time across a number of streets in Manchester. And then he catches up to my dad. My dad's trying to get away and he basically lands two punches, one to the side of the head, which is really weak. So my dad was completely blown back. That's the temple area, yeah. Exactly. But it's also where like we have our turbans as well. Yeah. So he's gone for him. And then my dad's fallen quite viciously to the floor. And he, rather than just leaving it there, he's grabbed my dad by the collar and knocked him into the eye as well. My dad obviously like was really injured. So there was like a pool of blood around him. And this man, as if he's literally just gone to the shops to buy chewing gum, has come out of it and just walked off. And then he's proceeded to just link up with his girlfriend again. And then they've just gone partying. This has happened and they've just gone on to, oh, we're just going to have the rest of the night. And they, like you say, partying, drinking, having fun exactly like father's laying there but even people in fights like you see fights even in like movies but you see like uh, i've seen the aftermaths of them in it people come in and they're completely shell-shocked even the people that have been the attackers they're like completely yeah. blown backwards this man treated it as if like it was a normal thing to do and he just like it's just disgusting that he just proceeded to have a completely normal life Night. He says he felt some regret, doesn't he? He says that, but he does, and his the, actions don't reflect it. I, I think the judge even saw right through that, as in in her sentencing, she literally says, "You've written me a letter trying to beg for reprieve, essentially." And she said, "You in this letter, you have quickly turned this on yourself. You don't care about the man you've affected at all. All you care about is how this is going to affect your life from now on. Because he wrote this letter thinking that it's going to support his case. And the judge literally turned around and said, you literally just care about yourself. So I think you fully are responsible for this. You hear the story and it's, it's one of those things that shocks you because we're supposed to live in a, in a country that is safe and is protective. You guys, you grew up, I guess, experiencing racism on a probably a daily basis uh, you know chatting before you were saying that you'd often get your turban knocked off and stuff like that by people it, it sickens me that we're in a world that is that 
in a country that it, that allows this to con- sort of to continue. As you say, I'm really glad that the judge recognised that. What 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 I struggle with is the judge is given a three year sentence. And that's the full sentence. That's not time off for good behaviour, whatever. So he could be paroled in, what, a year? I think this is why we're quite disgusted, to be honest, because, and confused, because initially this man was prosecuted under a Section 18. And then in the court, he... Um, what's Section 18? So a Section 18 is where you've pre- uh, caused grievous bodily harm with intent. And I think all of us on the CCTV footage saw that he intended to hurt my dad. I was going to say, I think even in a situation like this, like there's a murder aspect to it because you've taken the life that someone has. And yes, there's life there still, but it's in a split second, life's been completely rewritten to something that's a lot more challenging and a lot harder. What's he experiencing at the moment? Like how's his recovery been? it's been really tough so when this first happened we didn't know that he was going to survive so as I said like he was lying in a pool of blood and we have like a scale in medicine and everyone's a 15 and someone that's dead is a three and you start to have emergency procedures when someone gets to an eight and my dad was a five which means that he couldn't like move properly he just barely felt pain and his eyes were completely closed there was a, uh, and it was just absolutely grueling just to even hear that. The first six weeks were really hard in terms of we couldn't really live any day without thinking about, like, is he going to die today? So um, it was really hard in terms of just seeing him there because he was in ITU and he couldn't talk, he couldn't move, he couldn't open his eyes. His oxygen depleted massively which means that his brain was being starved of oxygen as well. He had like all sorts of bleeds. His brain started to swell, which meant that they had to cut a hole into his eye just to allow the pressure to lower so that he'd actually survive. They had to like make um, cuts into his skull as well, just so that they could monitor the pressure into his brain. And then he's completely lost all right-sided function. So he can't really move it properly at all without being in severe amounts of pain. Like even when we go to the hospital now, he still says to us, I've got so much pain in his right side. And um, one thing that I've not said is like, he can't speak English anymore. So because of the amount of bleeds and where they've happened in his brain, his language center has been completely affected. So he can't There's remember. Brain damage there created by this. Exactly. And so he, it's even more isolating for him, I'm guessing. Like Definitely, as in, like, whenever we went to the hospital, like, we know it's actually really hard, as in I've had patients, even recently, that find it really scary to ask for pain medication that they're entitled to. Mm. So some normally people have, like, a morphine drip, which is constant, but then they also have an additional amount of morphine that they can have if they request it. It's called PRN in medicine. And my dad already, like will be too scared to ask for things but he um can't actually ask for things because he can't speak english anymore because when traumatic head injuries happen you default to your mother tongue and his mother tongue isn't english so he's completely lost that aspect but he's so traumatized in terms of i remember really recently there was a man who tried to just visit another family member in the hospital and this was at 10 p.m at night and my dad rang my mom saying they're coming to get me and he was really scared and he just didn't know what to do his recovery has been really hard in terms of he's been really determined but i think he doesn't really fully understand his whole constraints because he is quite confused at the moment as well so he doesn't really understand a lot of things. He thought he'd just had a fall because of the PTSD. So he thought he'd just fallen by himself. And then when we told him that he'd actually been hurt, he didn't, he got really emotional and didn't understand why someone would hit him just because like he's never been in a fight in his life because he's yeah. just not the type of person to even argue. And it was completely unjustified and, and out of the blue anyway. So the, you don't even have that cognitive link as to what's occurred, this is just totally out of the blue. Something's happened. He's been stalked for a few blocks and then bam. 
this was the thing because when the police first told us as well they said oh your dad's brushed past someone and they said that he's hit them and I remember responding and I said my dad would never even like touch anybody else and if he did he'd completely apologize straight away so that there was no confrontation whatsoever and so when we watched the footage as well it proved it to us as in my dad didn't even touch this person either and yet being told that we were like that's not my dad at all like we know that that's not my dad there's a lot of aspects to this in terms of even being treated so when we first arrived at the hospital we didn't know what to expect and it was quite grueling in terms of my mum having to identify someone and her being scared that she's going to the next thing you know have to identify a dead body that's and, what you got straight away isn't it, it, it or, i guess it's on every you know procedure uh, pop show and all that kind of stuff you're going to identify someone because you're identifying a dead body exactly because you assume that someone that has to be identified can't identify themselves and his turban was completely covered in blood and just left on the floor next to his bedside when it has really significant i mean religious con- consequences for you guys too doesn't it? it's like putting a, like the queen's or the king's crown on the floor as in it's just not something you do like we as Sikhs see, see our turbans as crowns so there's something that we're really proud of and for someone to take it off and just put it into a plastic bag on the floor covered in blood was just really upsetting even him not being able to wear his turban in hospital was really upsetting because obviously with head injuries, he needs to be constantly monitored. So it's like, it's, it's basically um, unidentifying someone and making them lose a sense of their identity from what's happened since he's been in hospital, just because of the pressures on the NHS at the moment as well, he's caught a whole host of infections. So he's caught any infection really that you can catch in hospital in terms of MRSA, which is antibiotic resistant. He's caught COVID because they put him onto a COVID positive ward when he was being taken off ITU. He's had C. diff, which is really awful water infection. He's had pneumonia as well. So they had to monitor his lungs as well. Of course, all this is consistently hindering recovery because exactly. you're not just fighting the injuries you've had, you've received, you're fighting off infections and, and things in your body so you're the the, the knock-on effects of everything is just constantly almost kicking a man when he's down quite literally that's the thing and every single time he's been transferred as well as in the last ward he was on was really awful actually there was a lot of racism systemic and otherwise on that ward and every single time he moves obviously because of what he's been through he's so scared of strangers now so he regresses massively for the first week or so. So when he actually got transferred from that ward, he'd completely, even though in ITU he'd started to make sounds, he stopped making sounds again on that ward just because of how awful it was. And as you said, it completely like impacted his recovery as in he didn't walk again. He wasn't like making any efforts. I remember he kept like blaming us in a sense. He was like, I need to leave and you're not letting me leave. And he thought it was us that were keeping him there. And he just wanted to really just get out because he was so lonely because of like COVID on that ward as well. We could only see him for a certain number of hours per day. And as someone who can't even speak the same language as everybody else on that ward, who's he going to speak to when he's confined into a bed? It was absolutely awful. I want to ask, yesterday, we, my wife pointed out an article to me that was showing, she she keeps tabs and all this kind of stuff, but the wait in our local hospital for A&E services was 52 hours. We've had COVID. We've had, you know, all this stuff, that the, the knock-on effects in the NHS. You've got a really unique perspective in that you are a, becoming a doctor, very soon to be a doctor. Uh, you know, you've worked in these wards. You've worked in the NHS. You've been there saving other people's lives and all that kind of stuff. What needs to be done to to rescue this situation? Because it feels to me like, a lot of the, you know, aside from the initial event from this guy punching your father and, and nearly killing him, there's like a consistent, like we say, knockback of these different things. What needs to be done that's going to solve solve the issues that we're facing with the NHS and like these huge delays and people are dying as a result? I think there's just huge underfunding, to be honest. As in, like, he had to be constrained to that hospital because there wasn't enough funding in other hospitals 
And although, like, even just on the wards recently, there's meant to be six people, um, like the nurses to take care of all of the people in really severe conditions on my dad's bay, for example, there were only two because there wasn't enough funding. So my dad was left alone for quite a lot of the time. And, you know, as I've spoken about before, he's experienced racism and during that time he was racially abused by another patient and no one else was there to defend him either. So it's things like that. I think with the NHS at the moment, it's so pressurised that even basic things like making sure every area is completely clean isn't possible at the moment. And that's why my dad's also had so many infections. There's just there's another thing to do with the NHS as well so like during COVID like a lot of us struggled to even get masks so for the first two waves of COVID I didn't have a mask at all apart from the basic ones and when I was on like COVID positive wards I just had to wear like a normal mask knowing that it wouldn't offend me. That only protects the other person doesn't it those masks only stop you from spreading it. But I think all of this just comes very much from the government to be honest as in like a lot of this, even like down to the Crown Prosecution Service, all of this came from a tweet that a thread that I made, which has gone viral. But a lot of people talk about it that the Crown Prosecution Service itself is hugely underfunded, and that's why a lot of these cases get undervalued, essentially, yeah. just because of just chronic underfunding in every aspect of the public sector. Seeing it in so many ways, and I mean. Um, you know, we've seen it. We're seeing it with the disability side of things. You know, the, the amount of uh, people with disabilities who are the the, the mortality rates a lot lower in, in hospitals amongst uh, able-bodied. And I think when you bring in any ism, that mm-hmm. that that becomes a real issue. And so, like you're saying as well, this is tempered with racism being brought into it as well. And it, something you mentioned to me earlier that uh, was in our previous conversation was that. You know, they had the, the the hospital had to call you for every permission for things like shaving part of the head or part of the face to make to do certain operations to keep him alive. But also, they have significance for you spiritually and religious in your religion. Yeah, in terms of like, so they were talking about having to put a monitor into his head, and then they were saying that in order to save his life, they need to shave a part of his hair. And as people who have never cut our hair, it's one of those things that's just absolutely upsetting to hear. As in. But the thing is, like, there's no other choice. And because of how underfunded the NHS is as well, like even research into these sorts of things are chronically underfunded. But then you're talking to consultants and even I experience it here. All of the people that are working in these hospitals are amazing people, but everyone's just so burned out. So you don't really want to cause any more fuss because you know that they're completely at their wit's end. Even the consultant that was there with us at 2 a.m. when I arrived, he was probably going to sleep on probably the hardest sofa slash office chair possible. And so you don't want to make their lives harder either. And me seeing it from that side, yeah, you're too scared to like cause them any more, you know, upset or anything because you know that they're probably already on the brink of making mistakes because they're just so burned out. With your father bringing it back to everything that's gone on, what's his condition like now? How far has he come? And what's the, I guess, what does the future hold? So his condition now is quite um, okay for his, um, what's happened, as in, I think he's made leaps and bounds than people expected. So a lot of the consultants said, you know, we don't think he's probably going to walk again, uh, but he's walking with a frame now. He falls quite often just because he's so determined to come home. I think there's a lot of trauma. So the psychological aspect is coming back a lot. So he's starting to remember things in terms of like um, how many children he has, but also who's died in his life. And that's obviously really traumatic for him. He's He's got a lot of loneliness, I will be honest, as in he's not the type of person who's dependent on people and him not being at home doesn't feel right for him. I think he's very confused by a lot of things, but he does go into these states where he does very much just stare into the abyss because he, he just i think that's something that gets missed isn't it because we think about you know it's a physical recovery but uh, interestingly yesterday the day before we've done this is was world mental health day mm-hmm. 
And I mean, I, I was just doing a video earlier for my other channel talking about mental health and you know my experiences. I think poor mental health or, or, or going through depressions and stuff like that so often triggers but triggered by feelings of isolation and loneliness. And so in the mix, you know, everything you've, you've already described, the, the actual event itself, the, the systemic problems that are there, the infections, you've also just got this sense of isolation, which is going to link to mental health and even make it harder to, to make that recovery as well. Definitely, as in like, so during COVID, actually, I had a car crash because of um, isolation. So I was isolated in Margate during the second wave of COVID and I fell asleep. It was one of the hardest hitting things. But for my dad, just being able to carry out any of his daily activities. So as I said, he's a priest, so he can't read the prayer books anymore because his whole like eye is completely blind he can't turn a page because he doesn't have any control of his right hand anymore he can't you know normally we bow or things like that or sit comfortably he can't even cross his legs properly so there's all sorts of issues that are affecting him mentally because this is something that you do every single day like he'd get up at 5 a.m in the morning and start doing prayers or he'd go and walk to the Sikh temple and he'd do prayers for other people or go to their houses he can't do any of that anymore. So him com- constantly having this reminder as when we brought prayer books, we brought like hymns and everything for him to listen to. And I think it just serves as a constant reminder of his limited ability to do any of the things that he used to do, which is quite traumatic because I think as very religious people, we never really thought that he'd see religion as sometimes a burden just because of the way that is affecting him being able to pray I, I, I generally it's so moving hearing the story and hearing what's going on what really comes across to me and you know we're people at different parts of the country different races different beliefs but we're human and we share a humanity and what's happened is an affront to humanity to me that's um, literally what i said in court as in my impact statement i literally said I can't see the defendant as a human because humans are humane yeah. and to be humane is part of humanity. And if you're not being humane, I can't class you as part of humanity. I said that straight to his face because I truly believe that that's exactly what happened in terms of he was so inhumane to cause this. That is disgusting. As in, I think the courts, even the judge saw how much of an impact it had had and to be honest, she was amazing. Like if you were sat in that courtroom, it popped faith into us. But then when hearing the sentencing, it made us lose faith just because of how much he was able to get away with just because of. He's essentially that. taken someone's life away from. from exactly. And I think yeah, he's different. getting three years. Lucky if he's in for a year. That's literally it. And I think it's that type of thing where she was on our side as in she heard the arguments and she knew exactly what he'd done and yet she was constrained and you could tell she was constrained to the maximum five years and the only reason he got three was because he pled guilty and the only reason he pled guilty was because he was caught yeah. and there was cctv footage so and much footage you, you couldn't deny it could you yeah. exactly and it's like the the law literally says like if you plead guilty you automatically get a third off but it doesn't account for the fact that why you pled guilty so he didn't plead guilty because he felt any sense of remorse. We can tell that. Yeah. He pled guilty because he was caught. He, he, because, yeah, it was his best option. Exactly. He guilty well, because it was the right thing to do. Exactly. And he was like, oh, I thought about turning myself in, but we don't believe that at all. Because like, he, he was found packed. You said that, didn't you? He was found with his bags packed, ready to do a runner. Yeah, literally. As in they found like a suitcase fully packed of, of everything. Like he was ready to go. And his girlfriend has already fled. So we know that he had other places to go. It's like she's fled to Poland and she can't be touched anymore. So it's it's quite plausible that he would do literally the exact same thing. I want to really thank you for joining us today and for telling this story. If you wanted to take a message forward from all this, so people watching, listening, what, what would you say? What would be the thing that you could, to try and inject even a, a morsel of positivity into what's going on if we can take away something and learn from this what would that be for you i think it's down to 
my dad's core being, to be honest. And I spoke about it at the start. I think it's probably the thing that we should end on in terms of my dad's such a peaceful person and he lived a life without hatred. And yet this has happened to him purely because of hatred. So the next time anybody gives someone else a dirty luck, I think twice because it's all sorts of those sorts of things that have caused people to do this because people are so comfortable with being hateful now that it elevates and it elevates until it gets to that point. Whereas if you just thought twice about, you know, doing anything, nobody would be in this position. You said with everything going on, you mentioned earlier, and I know this wasn't why you've done this interview and it's not why you're on here, but you did mention there's a GoFundMe page. Yeah. Um, so I want to encourage anybody, if, if you can give a little to really help with this recovery in this situation, that would be amazing. We'll put links in the description. We'll put a card up here that you can click on as well if you want to just hop across and even donate a, a pound or two. And please do any any comments or anything like that. If you want to pass on your good wishes, put them in the, the comments. We'll make sure they get across to the family as well. I do want to say thank you to you guys as well. And this came from a Twitter um, post that I put on and there's been literally no negativity whatsoever on that post as in over 8,000 people have seen it and um, responded to it and every single comment that I've read and I've read every single comment and DM that people have given it's just been it's reinstalled and reinstilled faith into us and the family because guessing through something as bad as this hasn't been possible without everybody around us uh, and I'll uh, 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 echo that I think sometimes when you see the worst of humanity the best of humanity rises to combat it and it's an example of that but obviously that doesn't change the situation for what you guys are going through Curtis, I really want to thank you for joining us thank you for being so open and honest about your story and your father's story and what's going on for you guys so that was Gerdes and wow I it really really moved me as I say all links will be in the description for uh, anything you can do to support him absolutely fantastic uh, guy and really just really opened my eyes to a lot that's going on in the world please do go hit like hit subscribe and ring the bell you'll always know when that new content's coming online and you'll also be helping me with that 10,000 subscriber so please go do that I will see you again on the next episode but in the meantime please do stay safe